All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, thanks for spending some time with me today. Bef before we get uh, officially started, I want to make sure everybody knows to, to keep their microphones on mute. We'd like to limit the background noise as much as possible because we're going to record the session for those who may not be able to attend this morning. Uh, throughout the session, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them via the, the chat feature and I'll answer them through throughout the session. Uh, but let me start by introducing uh, myself. I see some familiar names out there, but for those whom I haven't met yet, my name is John Young. Uh, I'm the de Dean of Admission here at Hobart and William Smith. Uh, I've worked here for uh, almost 15 years now, so Geneva, New York uh, is home. I've been in this role um, for um, uh, the last two years almost, but I've worked in admissions for almost 30. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a fun time of year, traditionally in April, where we're usually welcoming people to campus uh, and showing the place off. And obviously, given the, the current pandemic, we're not able to do that. So we're trying to do the best we can uh, to communicate with as many people virtually as possible and answer everybody everybody's questions. So really the purpose of, of this session is to get your questions answered and, and talk about anything that would be helpful to you. We'll probably do a couple more of these as well. Uh, so if things come up um, that, that you hadn't thought about, please pay attention to our admitted student website, which will list all the sessions that we're doing and you can jump in and jump out of those uh, as it makes sense to you. Um, A lot of the, the people here are, are parents. I sent out a letter uh, to parents earlier this week and uh, I, the people, a couple of people responded um, to that letter and, and asked some, some really thoughtful questions that I'd uh, love to kick things off with. And then as, as you have questions, you can, you can put them in the, in the chat box and, and I'll respond to them. But the, the first question um, that, that I got, which was uh, from a family who I think is considering Hobart stand out from them? Uh, what is it that makes Hobart and William Smith special, especially in that, in that world of, of small uh, private liberal arts colleges? And, and to me, I would really like to highlight three things. Um, the first uh, is our academics. And, and to me, obviously, there, there shouldn't be any conversation about college that doesn't start there. And, and to me, there are two features to our curriculum that I think are, are pretty distinctive and, and special. First, uh, is that all of our students have to have a major and a minor. In other words, they have to have two areas of concentration before they get a diploma from, from Hobart and William Smith. And to me, I think that really does a, a terrific job in, in helping students uh, be able to explore more than one area. A lot of our students walk in the door and they might have an idea of a, of a, of a major or they might be entirely undecided. And by asking students to have a major and a minor, I think we allow students to explore a lot of different things. And, and one of the reasons it works really well here is uh, our academic departments are really in one of two areas. About half of our academic departments are what I would call traditional liberal arts disciplinary, that's the one area, uh, uh, majors, things like biology and economics and history, uh, art history, chemistry, French, uh, all the things you'd expect a, a small liberal arts college to have, we have. And all of those students have, uh, I think, an opportunity to do a really neat capstone at the end of their, uh, of the, their experience in the major. Uh, depending on the major, that could change. If you're a dance major, that's going to be choreographing a performance. If you're a history major, that's writing a thesis. If you're a, a physics major, that's doing a research project. So the nature of your capstone could change, uh, but there will be a capstone for, for all of our majors. The other half of our academic departments are what we would call interdisciplinary. Uh, majors and minors, things that pull from the traditional disciplinary areas to form their own single department here. Uh, things like international relations that pulls from history, pulls from political science, pulls from foreign language and, and economics uh, altogether. Um, architecture studies, not many schools our size have architecture to the extent that we do. And why is it interdisciplinary? Because uh, we won't just teach you uh, about the science and design of, of uh, buildings and construction, but you'll also take um, historic preservation courses. You'll take environmental architecture classes. You'll take courses in public policy to learn how to get your buildings built to work with local governments and, and building codes. Um, environmental studies, very popular at the colleges. We have a, a giant lake in our backyard. Uh, we use it all the time. And I think for, for students uh, to, to think about big issues from different points of view is exactly what interdisciplinary majors and minors do. Uh, if you're the environmental studies major and you're concerned with global warming, 
Um, you aren't going to solve that with just science. We're going to teach you the science. There's no question about it in that department. But you will also have looked at that issue from a political perspective, from an economic perspective, from a sociological perspective, so that when you go off into the world, you're able to think about things in a pretty broad way. So that's one feature of the curriculum. Uh, the other feature of the curriculum is that um, it's how we handle distribution requirements. Most small liberal arts colleges have them. We want you to go out and see a bunch of different things. But our faculty took a step back from them about 20 years ago and said, look, it, it is not that we want every Hobart and William Smith student to take an English class. That's not really what's important to us. What is important to us is that you know how to write well before you graduate from here. We don't need every student uh, to take a math class, but you do need to have quantitative reasoning skills before you leave this place. So our faculty developed what are known as our eight goals essentially eight skills that we want our students to have before they graduate. And they work with their faculty advisor to make sure they've taken a course that addresses each one of those eight skills before they graduate and do it in a way that makes sense for them in their curriculum. Uh, if you have that son or daughter um, who has a math phobia and they're looking at the quantitative reasoning skill uh, that they have to complete, um, that goal could be completed by taking a math class, but it also could be completed by taking uh, econometrics in the economics department um, or research methods in the sociology department. Anything that gets at you using numbers and, and doing analysis will, will really um, solve for a lot of this. So all of our students have to have a major and minor. They have to complete those eight goals. Uh, we now have upwards of 35% of our students double majoring. Uh, so that's certainly something you could do here. We work on a straight semester system. Students take four courses in the fall, four courses in the spring, 32 courses over their lifetime at the colleges. Uh, and most of our majors are 10 or 12 courses to complete the major. Most of our minors are six. Uh, so you can see there's plenty of room in there to double major or major and minor and still have plenty of time to, to complete those eight goals and uh, take courses around the colleges. All of our classes can double count. So something that counts towards one of your eight goals could also count towards your major, towards your minor. Uh, there's some courses that count towards your major and your minor um, that both work depending on what those subjects are. So I think that works really well. There's the academic piece. Uh, the second thing I want you all to know uh, is the community here. And obviously, Geneva, New York, uh, I think is a pretty special place uh, as someone who grew up uh, outside major cities most of my life. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily know what it was going to be like uh, to, to live in a small town in upstate New York, but there are 13,000 people here. Uh, given the geography, uh, it's been a terrific place for me to raise my family. And, and as I said, I've lived here for about 15 years and still haven't touched on half the stuff there is to do around here. Uh, some of that has to do with the emergence of the wineries in upstate New York uh, and the opportunities for people to, to go out and see some different things. I think it's brought a little more cosmopolitan feel uh, to, to Geneva. Uh, and I think our students really like the fact that they can walk into town and have some really different uh, food experiences, great restaurants, uh, kind of mom and pop feel uh, to, to uh, downtown Geneva. But if you go out the back of campus to the west, uh, it's more of the, the conveniences that people are used to. Um, uh, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, Staples, Walmart. Um, we also have Wegmans, our supermarket, which is very important for those of you who live in this neck of the woods. You know how important Wegmans are uh, to our students. It's a big deal. Um, the Aplex movie theater is right behind campus. So to have some convenience on one side and some hometown feel on, on the other, I think is a, is a terrific thing. Uh, but another big part of our community is the people. And I think as a small liberal arts college, we really pride ourselves, um, like a lot of our peers, in, in not letting students fall through the cracks. And, and we have a saying uh, on our campus that you'll be known for four years here. And I think that's very true. But what's important is the systems we put in place to make sure that happens. And I'll give you an example uh, of that. Um, one of the very important things that I think is a big challenge for our students is, is choosing their courses in their first semester of college. Uh, like a lot of schools, we've got a computer system where students could log in and just pick their classes and go. And when we got that computer system, uh, we allowed our incoming students to do that. And in a class of about 600 students, we found that we were making about 350 course changes over orientation because no offense, uh, students just weren't choosing well. They, they were overloading in one area or, or not exploring enough. You, you can imagine how that would, would happen. So we change things up and, and now what happens is our students still go into the computer system and choose their preferences, but then that list goes to their first year dean. And in admissions, we go and meet with your first year dean and tell them everything we've gotten to know about that, tell the dean um, everything we've gotten to know about that student. 
and then they put them in their first two courses, their first year seminar, which everyone will take in the fall of their first year, and that professor becomes their advisor, and one other course. And then when the student arrives for orientation, they meet with their advisor and choose their last two. So by the time a student arrives, their dean knows them already, their advisor has gotten to know them, and they haven't even started classes yet. And it's one of the real simple steps we take to help build community here uh, very quickly. And, and I think it gives people a lot of confidence in, in what's going on. Um, and I think the last thing that I would, I would point out as a, a point of distinction of HWS is how we prepare people for life after this uh, place. And, and we have a phrase on campus that says we're preparing students to lead a life of consequence, to make an impact, to make a difference in their community or organization or town, wherever it is they go uh, when they graduate from here. And, and I think um, it's one of the knocks on, on liberal arts colleges is that you're, you're not preparing people directly for a career. And I think we do an exceptional job of, of just that. And it's through our leadership program on campus where students can get a leadership certificate and, and really learn some amazing skills and attend workshops that'll help them in tons of different ways. Um, through our study abroad program, which is always nationally ranked and to have uh, over 60% of our students having an, uh, an abroad experience somewhere during their four years is pretty special with a variety of options uh, available to them. Uh, but I, I think more directly is our career services office that starts working with students when they're in their first year and may have no clue what it is that they want to do, uh, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to keep people going and get them connected, uh, do some surveys, help them figure out where, what their skills, competencies are, what their interests are, and then start having them explore. Uh, if they follow our career services program pathways, we guarantee them an internship or research. Uh, we also guarantee them funding for that. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a student who gets a, a great internship or, or research opportunity and it's unpaid and they can't afford to give up their summer job uh, back home uh, in order to, to do that great experience that would add to their resume. We want to get them a stipend. Uh, for those things. So I, I think it's an absolutely terrific opportunity for our students and, and gives them a, a pretty compelling resume by the time uh, they graduate from our place. Um, the second question that I had uh, was how have the colleges adapted to the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, and let me talk a little bit about that. It's, it's certainly far from uh, an ideal situation in, in our worlds, but I've been really proud not only of our faculty and staff and, and how they've managed this, but how our students have managed it as well. Um, first, we moved to a remote learning model where our faculty are, are delivering the course content um, remotely and they're doing it, uh, I think, in a way that is the best that they possibly can, given that we are an in-person institution that, that traditionally doesn't do this kind of stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's been amazing. Uh, perfect example is all of us sitting here on a Zoom call, uh, how our students now, that's part of their daily life and, and experience. Um, and I, I think what really impressed me was the faculty's willingness to be flexible and understand uh, that there are some students in time zones all over the world that were in their class. So to do something synchronously at 9 a.m. in the morning uh, on the East Coast may not work for people uh, on the West Coast or in other parts of the world. Uh, the same way they understand that, that learning this way is gonna be a challenge. So they've been really flexible in working with students, um, not only in, in terms of the course content, but grading and assignments. Uh, we've changed some, some administrative policies to allow students to pass fail courses as opposed to always get a letter grade. Um, students have the, the option uh, to do that, and I think we've been uh, really flexible as an institution, and I'm proud of how they've handled it. At the same time, uh, I think that small um, campus feel that we have is a challenge when people aren't here. And uh, I've been impressed uh, and amazed at how our, our um, student life staff, how the counseling staff has maintained contact with students. Um, they've continued all these Zoom sessions and phone calls and teleconferencing, all the ways to get the students the support that they, that they need, including emergency uh, monetary aid if they need it. Uh, I think it's been, been very important. Yet at the same time, uh, we've really been trying to say, hey, we want things to, to return uh, to the way we traditionally deliver education here. So uh, we've been continuing to do those um, career services sessions. A uh, perfect example is one of our alums is doing a Zoom session this evening for students who are interested uh, in careers in sports marketing and, and, and management. Uh, they're still having conferences with students. Um, our study abroad office is still selecting students to go abroad next spring. Uh, we choose our students to go abroad a year ahead of time 
Uh, so they've been working with our, our uh, current students to make all that happen. Uh, so we've been really trying to balance things as, as best we possibly can uh, with all of these things. So uh, it's, it's been a, uh, a challenge for us, but I've been really proud uh, of how the institutions reacted and how our students um, uh, have, have been flexible and, and understand this. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's important. Uh, so let me handle some of the questions that have, have popped up in the chat. Uh, so please continue to fire away and, and uh, I'll stay on as long as uh, there are questions here that need to be answered. Um, so one of the questions is how do how does, uh, our admitted students meet other students who are going to Hobart as, women, as members of the first year class? or other prospective students. We have a great Facebook page, the Hobart and William Smith Classes of 2024 Facebook page is the perfect place to do that. Um, students can go out, join that group. Um, all they have to do is put in a request and we'll let them join uh, that group, whether they uh, have chosen to enroll or not. Uh, so they can meet students who are, have already decided that this is where they're going to be, uh, or students who are still considering uh, Hobart and William Smith among their college options. So I'd point everybody towards that page. It's, it's great. It's a neat resource. Um, and you, as, as you know, uh, uh, look, I'm the parent of a 17 year old. They know how to then form uh, Instagram groups and chat groups and all the different things they want to do uh, outside of that Facebook page. So that's where I would point students if you want to interact with other potential incoming students. I think it's uh, terrific. Uh, we had a question about uh, orientation for incoming students. Um, we do two uh, programs here. Uh, let me talk about the one that all of our students take part in. That is our orientation program. Students come back four days before classes start. Um, they arrive on a Thursday. And that day is really spent for students just to move into their residence hall and get their sea legs. Um, parents, uh, if you might be coming, family members, if you might be coming, uh, most uh, families will come into town uh, on Wednesday evening. Uh, and then uh, when, when the program begins on Thursday morning, the first thing uh, as is tradition uh, at, at HWS uh, is you shake the hand of the president. Um, we do that right at the, the uh, steps of Cox Hall, and there's a symbolic reason for that. That's the same place where the students will receive their diploma uh, four years from now, and so we really like to bookend that experience. And then we have a, a giant tent on the quad. Uh, students walk through that, meet a ton of different people, get their keys to their residence halls, uh, and start moving in from there. Uh, there's some sessions throughout that day uh, on Thursday. But really, uh, by about 5 o'clock on Thursday, that's uh, time for parents to take off. Um, we really have students booked through uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, I know that can be frustrating sometimes for, for parents. So if it's time you want to spend with your student here in town uh, before orientation begins, let me encourage you to come a little early, uh, stay in a hotel or one of the spaces we have around town, which are great, uh, get your, do the things you want to do. Uh, because really once Thursday at five o'clock hits, um, they're, they're packed uh, schedule wise, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's not much time uh, for anybody to go grab a meal with a family member or, or show them around. So, so plan to come on the front side of that. We also have a pre-orientation program for students uh, who are interested in meeting a smaller group of people. We have, uh, it, it's called our pre-orientation adventure program, POAP. Uh, students are invited to do that. There will be groups that will go kayaking, groups that will go hiking through the Adirondacks. There's usually a service project as well. Um, we'll make that all available on our orientation website. So for students who have uh, who choose to enroll at HWS shortly after May 1. Uh, they will get a username and a password uh, that they can jump into the orientation website, start um, filling out all the forms that you need. Uh, but one of those will be an opportunity to attend the pre-orientation program uh, questionnaire they need to fill out and things like that. Uh, I've got another question uh, about the 3-2 engineering program. Uh, we have two different 3-2 uh, engineering programs, one with Dartmouth College, one with Columbia University. Uh, they follow a little bit different uh, model for students who are interested in engineering. Uh, the Columbia program is more traditional. You would spend your first year, sophomore, and junior year at Hobart and William Smith. Uh, you would leave at the end of your junior year and spend the next two years at Columbia University and get the two degrees at the end of the fifth year. Uh, the program with Dartmouth is a little different. Uh, instead of being a traditional 3-2, it's really a 2-1-1-1 program. You would spend your first year and your sophomore year at Hobart and William Smith, go spend your junior year at Dartmouth College, come back for your senior year, 
uh, at Hobart and Smith, graduate with your class, and then go spend another year at Dartmouth on the backside of that and get the two degrees in five years that way. They're a little bit different in terms of content, uh, what type of engineering they focus in on, uh, but let me encourage you all to go to the uh, Hobart and William Smith admitted student webpage. We did a great session uh, led by Don Spector, who is one of our physics professors and our pre-engineering advisor. Uh, you can jump in on that and uh, he gives you a lot, of, a little more nitty gritty information uh, on those programs. They're terrific. Um, this is a great question. What is the word you would use to describe the incoming classes? If there was a single word right now, uh, I would say eclectic. Um, I've been really impressed with the differences of ideas, backgrounds, geography, interests uh, of the students who have chosen to enroll so far. They're coming from all over the world, all over the United States. Um, it's really hard to get that one word that would describe the, the group. I've been um, really intrigued as I uh, as students choose to enroll I go back and look at their applications and read their essays again and uh, things that we've all seen before but obviously when they choose us uh, it's pretty neat to see and I'm excited uh, I think the thing I know that they should be looking forward to uh, is is checking their ego at the door a little bit when they arrive uh, be open-minded uh, not only to the people around them but to the opportunities that we provide our students so that they can take advantage of all those things so it's going to be an exciting time uh, to have them here. Uh, there's a question about the dual degree program. We have a pre-law program uh, uh, at Hobart William Smith. Most of our students will stay for four years and go straight off to law school, but we developed a new program with Cornell University so students can accelerate that process. Again, uh, they would leave here at the end of the junior year uh, and then spend the next two years at, at Cornell, uh, next three years at Cornell, get their law degree there. Um, we did a session on that as well. Uh, let me encourage you to look at that. It's on our admitted student uh, page, Lou Gard uh, and Scott Brophy, who is our pre-law advisor, uh, work with those students. Uh, I think the program is going to be competitive. It's not a guaranteed entrance, um, but this is the first year we've done it. We just signed those agreements uh, this past year, uh, so we're excited to see that. Uh, we do have a lot of students who decide to go off to law school, and a lot of them go to Cornell, so it was a, a neat, uh, very natural um, relationship for us to build, and I think it speaks well volumes to the um, way we prepare our students that, that Cornell was excited about doing a program like this. Um, how common is it to do a double major and graduate in four years? Uh, as I mentioned, we have upwards of 35% of our students double majoring, and it is absolutely a very common thing uh, for our students to do here. Uh, as I mentioned, it's usually between 10 and 12 courses to complete a major. Um, so if you um, are, are going to perhaps choose a, a, a double major, that could be somewhere between 20 and 24 uh, of your 32 classes. Uh, that still leaves you room to, to move around and choose. And again, things can double count. Some um, departments work much more naturally as a double major. So hypothetically, um, if you were double majoring in international relations and political science, uh, a lot of your political science classes would count towards your international relations major. So you, you wouldn't have to stack those on top of each other. Uh, the same way if you were doing a biology and an English double major, uh, that's going to take a little more of your coursework because those courses wouldn't count towards each other. So I think that's important. Uh, I got a question about uh, how academic advisors work with their incoming first year students to select courses. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. I think that's really important that the deans will put them in their first two classes based on uh, their preferences and what they chose and, and are um, meeting with them from an admissions perspective to make sure those two courses are appropriate uh, for them given their background and interests. Uh, but then on uh, the Friday of orientation, as I mentioned, students get here Thursday. On Friday, uh, all of the first year students will have an individual meeting with their advisor uh, to talk about what those next two courses are. Uh, and then on Saturday, they'll actually register for those next two classes. So I, I think it's a great way to build four courses. Uh, two are chosen for you before you arrive, then you choose the two when you're here. Changes can always be made um, during that orientation process. So I think it's great by the time classes start on Monday, Monday, people have their schedule and they're ready to go. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, really thoughtful. It's really cut down on the number of course changes that we made. Uh, I think I mentioned how we did it the old way. We made about 350 course changes uh, over orientation. Last year, we made less than 25. Uh, so I think that means students are getting the courses that they want uh, and are moving them forward uh, and making sure that they're not missing out on something that would be important. Perfect example is if you were interested in one of those pre-law or pre-engineering programs, there might be some courses you want to take your first year uh, to confirm that interest and move you along that path. Let's make sure you're in those classes. It works well. 
Um, given the uncertainty around COVID-19, are we considering changing the main one uh, deadline? Um, and let me talk about that. Um, we have decided to keep our May 1 deadline, but we will extend the deadline for any family who requests it, no question asked. If people want until June 1 to make up their mind, we certainly will do that. The reason we chose not to extend that deadline is because, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start putting people in those classes and matching them up um, with their first year seminar advisor, put them in that second class, get them matched up with roommates. Uh, the process starts moving along here. And as I mentioned, it's a pretty individual process and, and we want to make sure we do it as thoughtfully as we possibly can. Um, in order to do that, we need time. And, and so I didn't want to move that to June 1 and, and just have everybody put off depositing then and then potentially miss out on uh, some that first year seminar that they really wanted because we filled it uh, by June 1. Uh, so if anybody requests it, we absolutely will do that. Uh, we always allow our students to defer if there's a plan that they want to have um, for a year or, or a semester to do something different. All they need to do is make that request in writing. And if the committee that reviews those says, yeah, this is a good plan, we'll grant that deferral for a year. Um, what we're really not sure about uh, is students who, dis who defer, one, for athletic reasons. I don't know that that's a good reason to defer. Uh, two, um, I I'm really hoping uh, that students who defer come up with a good plan for the year. Uh, obviously, given the current pandemic and, and what's going on that way, that might change things, and we totally understand that, and we'll be flexible that way. But what I would encourage students to do is if this is the place they know they want to be, uh, send in their deposit, enroll at Hobart and William Smith, and if things change, obviously we'll be flexible in granting those deferrals. We are planning to start school in August, um, and, and that's um, what we are hopeful will happen. Uh, but obviously, we have to pay attention to what our state leaders are saying here in New York. And uh, thankfully, given where we are in New York, uh, there's a lot of uh, ability for social distancing and all the things that will help keep our students safe. Uh, so we've got a task force that's really preparing a range of options um, if we are unable to start um, at the end of August what if we can start in mid-September? Do we push, just push the start date back? Uh, do we start things virtually and then move to in-person instruction? Uh, we're gonna consider all of those things. Uh, and, and I think we have to keep the safety of our, of our students, our faculty, our staff primary and how we make those choices. Uh, and we're gonna act in, in everyone's best interest that way. There's no question about it. Um, all right, uh, question about the leadership certificate program. Yes, uh, any student uh, who wants to be part of HWS LEADS, uh, that's our leadership certificate program, uh, that is really done uh, as an add-on to their normal academic uh, program. It's a half credit course uh, each semester uh, for six semesters along with a uh, program uh, at the end where they create their own leadership pro uh, development program. Uh, and that's what gets them that leadership certificate. It's put on their transcript. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, please take a look at our Centennial Center website. Uh, it gives you a lot of the details about what that leadership program looks like, and they can certainly do that while completing a double major or a major and minor while they're here. Um, how will COVID-19 affect our study abroad programs? Let me talk first about uh, how it affected things this spring uh, when it became clear where things were going. We brought all of our students back. Uh, and one of the things that I really appreciated was the institution made those arrangements. We didn't uh, have students pick up the phone and, and call travel agents. We made those arrangements for them and got them all back safely to the United States uh, as, as quickly as we could. We have an absolutely incredible uh, global education staff uh, that really works with our students and, and not only did a terrific job getting them back, but then making academic arrangements for them to finish their coursework so they wouldn't be out credits uh, or short uh, on plans for graduation. They did a terrific job. Uh, we're monitoring the situation as far as our fall uh, programs and we'll pay attention accordingly depending on where they are. We're certainly preparing um, for students not to be abroad this fall. Um, one of the things that traditionally students are doing at this time is choosing uh, our current students are choosing their fall semester classes. We've asked everybody who's studying abroad to choose on campus classes in case their study abroad program doesn't go. Uh, so they'll be in their courses uh, for the fall if, if their trip can't leave. Uh, but in addition to being registered for those uh, abroad trips. So we wanna make sure we have a fallback program uh, for the students um, who are planning on going abroad this fall. Um, how long do, do students have uh, to switch out of a class? We have uh, two things. One, there's a really a week long 
uh, program where students can switch classes. Um, and when students arrive here uh, in August and classes start on Monday, they will have until the following Monday uh, to switch classes. So it's, uh, we, students call it syllabus week, uh, where the faculty member goes over the syllabus, really talks about the expectations of courses. You'll see students who will be registered for four, but they'll go visit some others and decide if one is a, a better fit for them. So we really give them a week to do that. Uh, they can make those switches uh, up until that up until that point uh, to change. Um, and I think that works really well for our students. We don't want them to get behind in any classes. So uh, that first week is, is critical and we're ready to start. Uh, can 3-2 students study abroad? Yes, they can. Uh, they just need to work very closely uh, with uh, their faculty advisor and our study abroad office to make sure they're getting all the credits that they need. Uh, I think that's a, a big, um, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, a misconception about study abroad, that there are certain majors that just can't study abroad. Here, we love our students to study abroad, whether they're uh, science majors, 3-2 uh, engineering major uh, plan, whatever the, the thing is that they want to do, they just need to work closely with their faculty advisors. And, and what I love about most of our abroad programs is they're led by our faculty members. Um, so those courses that they're taking are in our course catalog just as if they were on campus. So they'll count towards their marriage if they want, they shouldn't get behind in, in credits if they're going abroad. As a matter of fact, we, we don't want them uh, to, to do that. Uh, what are some of the best ways to learn more about Hobart and William Smith? Let me first point people towards our admitted student webpage. I think it's a terrific uh, collection of information. Uh, not only are there invitations to all these Zoom sessions that we're doing, but there's links to a bunch of videos. Um, at the bottom of that page uh, is a link to all of the first year seminars that will be taught uh, this fall. Uh, and I think it's a terrific way to see hey, here are the courses that, that your students could be taking uh, in the fall and who the professor is who would be their advisor. Uh, I think it's a great way to investigate things. Uh, for people who are really interested in a specific major, let me encourage you all to look at the course catalog. It's online. And if you were to learn about a specific department that's really important to you, uh, you want to be a history major at the colleges, go look at those courses that are offered there. And if they sound really interesting to you, then this is probably a good fit. Uh, if they don't, then maybe you should look someplace else. Uh, I think the course catalog is an underused resource uh, for students when they're, when they're making their final decisions about where to go to college. So please pay attention to that. Um, one of the questions is, uh, do students have to live on campus uh, all four years? Uh, yes. Uh, we require our students to live on campus. We are a residential uh, four-year liberal arts college. We expect people to live here. We do allow a small number of seniors to live off campus if they choose to do that, um, but that's done by lottery, and we, uh, we plan to allow 50 uh, students in the senior class to live off campus. One of the reasons that's not a big issue for us is the variety of options. In addition to the traditional residence halls that most colleges have, we've got a great set of houses that are, if you've been to campus, you'll know they're right along the lake surrounding campus, so you can be a little bit on your own, uh, but right on campus at the same time. We also have a great set of townhouses that are very very popular for our upper class students. So you have an own, your own kitchen, your own space, uh, yet you're on campus if anything goes wrong. I think that's a good thing. Uh, one of the questions are, are we becoming test optional because of COVID-19? Uh, this is a good and easy answer. We have been test optional for 13 years now, so that's nothing new for us. Uh, we have uh, sort of gotten used to that and typically about half of our students will submit standardized test scores, the other half will not. So uh, there's nothing really new there. Uh, we're prepared for that uh, and, and it's one of those times that I've been very glad uh, that we are a, a, a test optional institution. Um, one of the questions is, could I elaborate on the education program? We have a great teacher education program here at the colleges where students can be certified to teach. Um, we have some uh, really great options, in, including special education options. Uh, students will get placed to do their um, uh, student teaching in all of the local area elementary uh, or high schools. Um, most often, uh, students will do that in their senior year. But we also have a master's in teaching. It's our only master's program where students could stay for a fifth year and get their master's. If they are planning to do that, most of them will do their student teaching in that master's year. Uh, it's a little easier to fit schedules in that way. So I think that's a, it's a terrific program. We did a session, Zoom session on that. Let me point you towards uh, that admitted student page and, and click on that. I think you can learn a lot uh, from our faculty who lead that program. Uh, it's great. Um, do we prepare uh, pre-med students if one wants to be a physician assistant? Absolutely. Um, our pre-health advising program is terrific for students, whether they want to go off to medical school and be a doctor, whether they want to be a PA, go to dental school, uh, you name it, any type of healthcare profession. Uh, I think our, our pre-health advising program works tremendously well. We have see students who go off to a variety of graduate programs 
programs that way. Uh, and that committee works with students. Uh, Scott McPhail uh, is their student's point of contact and he will run sessions over orientation uh, to make sure students are taking the right courses and, and on the right path. Uh, he is terrific. There aren't many people on our campus who I would tell uh, a, a current student uh, to shut up and listen to what they say and just go do it, but he is one of those people. Um, he really knows his stuff uh, and really can, can act in students' best interest to, to give them the greatest chances uh, of pursuing the career that they want. Um, I, I think the, the uh, pre-med career um, option that, that students follow uh, is pretty popular here. Um, they ask for uh, the Health Professions Advising uh, Committee will ask for recommendations from a variety of sources, uh, support those students as they plan, whether that's those MCAT exams uh, that are, are critically important or helping them prepare their applications. Uh, I think uh, Scott does a fantastic job. All right, uh, do sports interfere with classes or is there a specific time when there are no classes in sports practice? So yes, traditionally um, our sports practices will begin at the end of the school day uh, so that they don't, don't run up against academic areas. There's always gonna be those exceptions where there's labs, where there's certain things that happen in the evening. Um, but I think most coaches and faculty members are, are pretty flexible that way. About 28 to 29% of our student body are varsity athletes and I think they need to plan their time uh, wisely, but um, most athletes that I've talked to here would certainly argue uh, that they do better when they're in season uh, and have to be more disciplined than when they're off. So uh, I, I think it's a, a, it's a terrific uh, program for students who want to play varsity sports here, but we are uh, about as competitive a Division three program as you can find in Division one for men's lacrosse. Uh, so anybody who hopes to play sports at college uh, here, if you have not already, let me encourage you to reach out to the coach. Um, we, we don't have a ton of the traditional walk-on student here. So let me um, really uh, encourage your son or daughter, if, if they are thinking about playing a varsity sport here, they should get in touch with the coach uh, well ahead of time. There certainly will be tryouts, uh, but I think uh, most students really don't just show up that day and try out. There's a lot of prep work that, go, that goes into that. Uh, what's the best way to get feedback to professor instructor style of teaching? Uh, that's a tough one. I, I think uh, our faculty have a ton of different styles. Uh, there's not one that works for uh, for all of our, our students and for all of our faculty. Um, professor Hood, I was just speaking to in the history department, uh, he is more of a lecture guy uh, and will will has a three day a week class and usually two days of those three days he's lecturing and then the last day of the week will be much more of a discussion based. Other people, you're sitting around a table the entire time and, and doing a traditional discussion-based class where students have done the work ahead of time and they're discussing the topic. Um, when you get into science instruction, there'll be lab components to things. So I don't know that there's one uh, style of teaching that our faculty have here. I think that is a little more subject and, and personality dependent. Uh, another question about changing the SAT, ACT requirements. Uh, yeah, we don't have anything to change that way because we are test optional. I think it's something um, that, that um, we don't have to make any adjustments on uh, in, in our world. Um, how will the AP scores for this year transfer over since they're from home? Yeah, we uh, actually, it's funny, we we're just talking about that with the Dean of the Faculty. We plan to grant credit just like we always did, even though the tests won't look the same way uh, that they traditionally have. So for us, if students get a four or five on the AP exam, uh, we will give them course credit here. Sometimes that gets them into a more advanced course. Um, most times it just gives them course credit so that they have it in their back pocket. And I think that's a, a useful thing. Um, can I speak a little bit to some of the president's key priorities were for this year and, and next? Uh, as a matter of fact, the timing is perfect. Uh, she is just about, this is uh, President Jacobson. This is, uh, we're just, uh, she hasn't even hit her one year anniversary here. She started here uh, last July. Uh, she's been a, a terrific addition to our community and, and we're excited about her presidency. Um, she is just putting the final touches on her strategic plan. Uh, for the colleges, uh, and that will be uh, uh, approved by lots of different committees, and there's been lots of feedback uh, for that. Uh, I just got a, a good look at it. Um, I think there's going to be uh, really three main areas uh, that that's going to be focused in on. Uh, one uh, is is um, really 
focused on the, the academic and administrative excellence of the colleges and making sure we're efficient as we possibly can, uh, given this day and age, uh, and certainly given the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, given the economics of things, it's really important that we maximize the opportunities that way. Uh, but I think our second area of interest is, is going to be um, really focused on, on um, financial stability and making sure the colleges are doing the right thing. There will be a big fundraising campaign, as you can imagine, that comes with the new president. Uh, we'll be announcing that campaign. Uh, and how do we enhance the reputation of the colleges? And I think that's uh, really identifying some of our signature programs here and, and, and maximizing them. What does it all mean tangent, uh, tangibly for, for your students? Uh, I don't think uh, it'll be long before we uh, start drawing up plans for a new science facility here. We've got some great space, uh, but they're kind of segmented. So to do a science facility that's all together uh, would be great. We just finished a, a performing arts center that really brought three departments, our music department, our theater department, and our dance department all under one roof. And there's really been some great synergy that happened that way. So to do the same thing in the sciences, uh, I think would, would be really smart. I think uh, President Jacobson has really um, seen the strengths that we have in our study abroad programs, in our career services programs, in our leadership programs, in our service programs, connecting with Geneva, and let's enhance those uh, and do all the things that, uh, that, that we can um, really do to help our students um, excel in those areas. So we're really working hard to do that. Um, all right, so uh, th those are the questions that I saw in the chat. Um, please, um, if there are any questions that come up further, don't hesitate to send them um, my way. My email address is jyoung, jyoung, at hws.edu. Uh, you can link to those on the admissions page if students want to connect with their uh, individual admissions counselor. Uh, they certainly can do that as well. Uh, so please, we wish you all the best as you are moving up into this uh, decision deadline. As I mentioned in that letter, I've got a 17-year-old at home who's going through this process and it wasn't at all like we thought it was going to be before this pandemic hit. I think I expected to be spending my month of April uh, spending time on campus with all of your students and the other time shuttling around with mine uh, to look at different schools. Uh, and obviously this has changed dramatically uh, how we go about doing things. And, and we appreciate everybody's flexibility and willingness to adapt to all this. It has been a big challenge uh, for, for everyone. Uh, but I think it's, it's been an amazing uh, opportunity uh, to get to know students in a different way and maybe in fact seeing more students than I would have seen otherwise. Uh, so uh, keep your chin up. Um, I, I really believe this. I mentioned this in my letter, but we have a lot of data that says um, student success in college is linked a lot to their feeling of family and parent support for the choice that they made. And obviously everybody has different opinions uh, about where their son or daughter should go to school. I know I've got mine. Um, but I think what's absolutely critical is once your son or daughter makes that choice that you go all in and say, hey, I'm proud of you. I love you. It's a terrific choice. We support it 100%. And I think that will lead a ton uh, to their success uh, over the next four years. Uh, so if anything comes up, if there's any way I can be helpful or if we can be helpful here uh, at HWS, we are happy to do it. So please don't hesitate to get in touch and, and best of luck to all of you. Thanks.